Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will cover some new research findings suggesting that training a muscle at long lengths may result in superior hypertrophy. First, it should be noted that what we will discuss in this video relates to biarticular muscles rather than monoarticular muscles. Biarticular muscles are those which cross more than one joint and therefore act to move more than one joint. For example, all the hamstrings muscles are biarticular, apart from the short head of the biceps femoris, because they originate on the pelvis and insert on the tibia and fibula. This means they cross both the hip and knee, and therefore act on both joints. In this case, the hamstrings produce both knee flexion and hip extension. On the other hand, a monoarticular muscle is one which only acts on one joint. An example of this would be the soleus, which is one of the calf muscles. This muscle originates on the fibula and inserts on the heel bone via the Achilles tendon. Therefore, it only acts on the ankle joint with its primary function to plantar flex the ankle. So now that we understand what a biarticular muscle is, let's explore the influence of muscle length on hypertrophy adaptations. First, let's look at this study which compared different calf raise variations on muscle activation of different calf muscles. Subjects performed loaded calf raises in a seated calf raise machine and a standing calf raise machine, and muscle activity was compared between exercises. It was found that soleus activation was similar between exercises, however both medial and lateral gastrocnemius activity was much higher in the standing variation. This is likely because the gastrocnemius is a biarticular muscle. The gastrocnemius originates on the femur and inserts on the heel bone via the Achilles tendon. Therefore, it crosses both the ankle and knee joints and produces both ankle plantar flexion and knee flexion. This means that knee position will influence its activity. So basically, there was greater muscle activity in the standing calf raise when the knee was extended, or in other words, in a straight position. This position places the gastrocnemius at a longer length during the exercise. So it seems at least in this case, when muscles are at a longer length, they may be more active in a movement. However, this study only looked at muscle activation, not actual muscle growth. While this may indicate that training a muscle at longer lengths could lead to greater hypertrophy because muscle activation is greater, we can't be entirely confident that this would be the case. Luckily, we have a similar study which explored direct hypertrophy outcomes when training a muscle at different lengths. This study compared the effects of training with the seated versus lying hamstrings curl on hamstrings hypertrophy. Subjects performed the same hamstring curl training protocol with one leg performing the seated curl and the other leg performing the lying curl. Both limbs saw significant increases in muscle size, but the seated leg curl induced greater muscle growth of the entire hamstrings than the lying variation. Furthermore, if we look at the changes on an individual muscle level, we can see that the biceps femoris longhead, semitendinosus and semimembranosus all saw superior growth from the seated hamstring curl. However, hypertrophy of the biceps femoris short head was similar between limbs. So the three biarticular hamstrings muscles grew more in the seated variation, which is when the muscle is at a longer length. However, the biceps femoris short head is a monoarticular muscle acting only on the knee joint because it originates on the femur rather than the pelvis. Therefore, hip position doesn't impact biomechanics of the biceps femoris short head, which is probably why there was similar muscle growth between limbs for this muscle. So what do these results imply for hypertrophy training? Before getting too excited, we should first appreciate that we only have one direct study assessing this phenomenon. Therefore, we need more research before making drastic changes to our training programs. However, these findings may indicate two primary implications. The first implication is for range of motion. These results provide even further evidence in support of full range of motion training compared with partial range. While we already have direct evidence suggesting that greater range of motion is generally superior for hypertrophy, this phenomenon may provide a mechanism. Training with full range of motion is going to train the muscles at a longer length than training with partial range of motion. This may be a potential reason explaining why full range of motion is generally more hypertrophic than partial range. And the second implication is for exercise selection. Trainees may want to preference exercises which train the muscle at longer lengths. This is because even if two exercises target the same muscle group, these results indicate that training a muscle at longer lengths may be more hypertrophic. It should be noted that this phenomenon is only relevant to biarticular muscles. An example of where this may be applicable is when selecting exercises for the biceps. 
because the biceps are a biarticular muscle, it may be more hypertrophic to perform bicep curls when the shoulders are in an extended position. Therefore, an exercise like the incline seated dumbbell curl may be a good option to maximally stress the biceps. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.